All right. And if you just make sure, look at this once in a while, make sure it's actually recording just once in a while. All right, guys. Welcome to night one of Open Water. My name is Benjamin Hatfield. I'll be your um, senior instructor tonight. Um, I'll be accompanied by Aaron and David, who are dive masters that uh, I'm very proud to say that I trained up to the dive master status. Aaron's got more dives than me, so we just don't talk about that too much because he's cooler than I am. But uh, David, I, I actually did his open water as well, so it's kind of cool and kind of neat to have the opportunity to have people that I've trained up to this level and, and bring in for different levels of experience. Um, my qualifications to teach this class, I have on the board, I'm a dive master instructor, I'm soon to be an, an assistant instructor trainer, but I'm also extended range instructor as well, which means I, I teach the very, very advanced type of diving that is well beyond this class. Um, but what that means is I take everything that I teach you, um, I take it, I have another class where I take all that, I, I wad it up, throw it in a little ball, and we pitch it in the trash, and we go way well beyond all that fun stuff. Um, you'll see my wife kicking around. She is fantastic, amazing, and far better than I could ever deserve, but her name is Nikki. Uh, she is an assistant instructor. We've gone through everything together. Anything that I can teach, uh, she understands as well. She just um, is uh, at still at the assistant instructor level, but she is put up with more than any one human should have to as well. That is for sure. Let's see. So some of the cool things uh, as you go through this, you will notice that I have pictures. I like pictures. I hope you like pictures too. If you don't, I'm sorry, just too bad. I do pictures anyway. Um, but usually the pictures are um, ones that either I took or that I am in just to give you an idea of, of fun stuff. I'm not a big fan of the generic picture stuff. Um, but as we're looking around, this is at the crater in uh, 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 Homestead. Uh, there I am in the lower portion as well. This is my instructor trainer class when I eventually uh, initially became an instructor. And this was my instructor trainer, Gary. Um, this is in a random lake somewhere, um, and this is uh, a picture I took of my wife in a cave. We were about 110 feet, 108 feet, somewhere around there, in a, in a cave diving. And so, yes, people dive in caves intentionally. Um, some of us even climb through caves and get all muddy and yucky because we like, we like mud and the taste of dirt, I guess. I'm not sure. It's, it's, there's, there's weird people in this room. I'm just going to—I'm not going to point out anybody's—I mean, uh, any, any Aaron in the room, but— Overall, um, if you are interested in what we're teaching and you decide that diving is for you and you want to continue your journey, there are all kinds of cool specialties you can continue your diving journey with. Here's a, a, a list of things that I personally can, I can teach. Um, so as you can see, there's a few things past this class. Um, overall, I like to think of open water as uh, entering first grade. You've just learned how to not eat the crayons and and at this point, we're going to get you breathing underwater. But after that, there's this whole ginormous world of diving out there and really, really cool things to do. Um, but that gives you a few ideas of some of the things that I personally can teach as well. My guy, my assistants today, uh, David Wilson. David Wilson joined us in August at Open Water, um, was a fun student, has been very, very comfortable in the water and done a great job. David, want to tell us a little about, about yourself? David, I've been certified as a Dive master since January of this year. My name is David. I've been a dive master since January of this year. Uh, I actually started scuba diving on a fluke. I just heard about the shop and called in to see how much the, the classes were. And she's like, by the way, we're starting this week. And I was like, sweet, I'll be there. And so I, uh, I've always loved the water, always loved being in the water. And this, this gives me an opportunity to be in the water where other people aren't. I think David also holds the world record uh, longest dive at, at – uh... Belmont Hot Springs. I don't know that anybody else's dough has as long a dive at Belmont Hot Springs. What was that? 80 minutes? 80 minutes at Belmont Hot Springs. <laughs> Aaron is my other dive master and fantastic instructor. So my name's Aaron. I've been diving since 2003, so a few years. Um, I did a lot of commercial diving, um, which basically you put a lot of lead on your feet and stay on the bottom and Basically, commercial diving means everything's harder. It doesn't, it's not really that impressive. You just do a lot of work underwater and try not to die while you're doing it. Um, I started with Ben. I actually dove with him about four or five years ago. Started mm -hmm. doing a few dives here in the river. And um, now that I'm the, the dive team leader for our search and rescue in Bingham County, the natural next step is to be able to actually teach the classes. So I'm working my way to instructor. Um, done a few tech classes now. Started doing stuff because I do love dry caving. I've been caving since I was like 12. Now 
try and get into the sport that'll really kill me, which is cave diving. Um, that's my ultimate goal in the tech side. But as a professional, I you know want to be able to teach people because I love this so much. Passionate sport I have. So. That's one of the things you're going to find common. If you find somebody that gets to the point of dive guide, dive master, assistant instructor, instructor, technical instructor, dive master instructor, assistant instructor, trainer, and that, there's a lot of work that goes involved to become to that point. And it's not something you do because you don't want to. There's a lot of cost, there's a lot of work, and there's a lot of study and, and time underwater to get to this point. Um, I'm somewhere around 3,000 dives myself. Um, Aaron is, I don't know, 50,000 dives, 100,000 dives, I don't know. He's got more time underwater than a lot of us have on the, the earth. But uh, you do it because of the passion. And when you get into the point where you're like us, where you're teaching, it means you absolutely pa positively love what you do. You love diving. Um, you love, and you want to expand and, and share that with others. Um, we also have Josh with us. Uh, Josh, I did his open water certification. So Josh is going to um, be shadowing our class and watching so he can gain, learn, and, and learn that experience. Um, and eventually get to that point where he's a dive guide as well. And so, interestingly enough, the way we teach and uh, take uh, dive guides and master divers is we bring it, bring you back into classes so you can continue learning and watching other classes. And we do it as a mentorship program. We say, okay, great, you love open waters diving. We want to mentor you to the next level. Um, rather than sit you down and say, okay, here's a class and, and do more of this, just talk, 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 talk. We put you under our arms and then we shadow you, have you shadow and then we talk about what we did and we get your experience and help you build experience and comfort in the water through that process. So that's how we build dive masters, assistant instructors, is through a pure mentorship program. So if you like this and that's a direction you want to go, uh, advanced open water diver, master diver, dive guide, dive master, they're all within your reach, um, and we're happy to help you get there. Thank you, sir. So you do get weird people that do weird things of diving as well. Uh, one of the things that I really like doing is I like to teach ice diving. Um, and I teach uh, quite a few sessions every year. So this is uh, myself, I'm on the left, um, and uh, my wife is over here holding my rope. She's one of the few people that I, I like letting hold my rope. Um, and then this is a student in the water with me. I take one student down at a time and I do dives with them. I don't know if it'll play. I think this is the one that I need to, to reco recopy over. Maybe it will. Oh, maybe I fixed it. Video unavailable. I think what? Let's try this. See if that actually works. Oh, good. It's going to work. I think I have them too, which is interesting. I'm not sure where the other one was. Apparently, I'm not as technically savvy as I think I am. So the big thing is, first off, we cut a hole through 12 to 18 inches of ice. And then after we do that, we like to dance on the ice just because we're weird. You also find that uh, divers at most levels have a unique sense of humor as well. But this is Ryrie Reservoir. We'll be doing our open water certification just down this way a little bit. Don't worry, the ice is gone and left last week. <laughs> We're all wearing what's called dry suits. And so I actually, um, I'll wear stuff like this underneath my dry suit. Um, and we stay completely dry. This is the process of putting a dry suit on. I leave my, my jeans on. I put on an undergarment. I've got wool socks on. And then once I get the, that on, then I put the dry suit on, zip up, and we get in it. And pretty much everybody you see on the ice is somebody I certified in ice diving. So, the anchor. And I'm on the left there. Uh, water's pretty warm. It's 38 degrees, 37 degrees. We're always connected to a rope. This is what it actually looks like. 
the ice this year was this particular year was uh, only 16 inches thick. And that's actually me. But yeah, that's so you get some weird people that do some weird stuff in diving. And so there's pretty much no limit um, to your diving other than, you know, sand, obviously. But um, there is lots and lots of opportunity. So the diver diamond philosophy, what every diver should know. What we're going to do is I'm going to teach you um, the knowledge in the classroom. And I shouldn't say I will, but my fantastic dive masters will, and I'll be supervising. We're going to practice and work on some skills. From that point, I'm going to introduce, we're going to introduce you to the equipment and how to put it together. Uh, from that point, SSI says experience. But for me, experience comes in twofold. I'm going to give you the experience in the equipment and how to use it correctly. But I want you to have a good experience as well. Your experience and how you feel about diving Will determine your career. If you have a good experience in this class, you'll have good experiences diving, right? And you'll want to do it more. We want you to do it lots and lots and lots and lots and get to the point where you have five times more dives than all three of us put together. Well, that's absolutely what we'd love to hear. The other thing is, is we asked on a personal note, after I certify you guys and you guys go to Australia or Bermuda or Texas, <laughs> where, or wherever you go diving, I want you guys to take pictures and I want you to post them to our Facebook page. I want you to send them to me, text it to me. I want you to call me and tell me about your dives. I want to know. I want to live vicariously through your dives and hear what you guys are doing and enjoy it with you. That's for me is the biggest excitement and the best thrill is when I've trained somebody up, signed on your card and you get to go out and use it and you'll love it. So experience for me is twofold. We tap the next. Yeah, the, that would be slick. So our process is going to look like this. We're going to start training. We're going to learn some skills and develop abilities. We're going to do some water sessions. We're going to review those skills and learn some new skills. I'm going to help you increase your confidence. Um, now, when it comes to confidence, like I want you guys to understand that the four of us have done this about a billion times, right? We know these skills. We are not going to progress at our pace. We're going to progress at your pace, right? There's a simple sign. If I ask you to do something and you are not comfortable, I'm going to teach you your first hand and arm signal. When I ask you to do something and you're not ready for it, you just say, stop. It's okay. Anybody can end a dive at any time for any reason without consequence. If I ask you to do a skill and you're not comfortable, stop. It's okay. We'll probably talk about it, but I promise you, <clears throat> David's been teaching with me since, uh, for a year now. Aaron's been uh, friends with us for four, year, four or five years. Have you guys ever heard me yell at anybody? Not once. Like you need something from a distance. Yeah, just to make myself heard, but not yelling. Just loud enough to be heard. I'm not that guy. I don't yell. I don't scream. I don't jump it down. I don't get upset. No point in it. No reason in it. It wastes energy. So, if you are going, we're going too fast. Just tell us. Just give us the stop. And you can say, if I'm asking you to do a, a mastro, and you're like, no, just you can point back and ask me to do it, and I'll do it for you. Not a problem. At some point, you'll have to pass the skill to pass the course but we'll pass it at your pace, not ours. Fair enough? Okay. Um, let's go back one. Um, we're going to review those skills even more. We're going to invoke some conditioned responses as our goal to get to the point where this is almost second nature, and then you'll become a safe diver. Next slide. Course standards and expectations. I expect that you guys will all download the MySSI app, log in and do your homework, upload a headshot to your computer, Participate in class. You're going to do two to four academic review sessions, two to four pool sessions, four open water dives. I try and end the session, uh, every one of my students, with six open water dives to give you just a little bit more experience. Um, equipment assembly and water work. Everybody has to pass the final exam with an 80%. Don't worry. The multiple choice is pretty easy. It's the essay questions that get everybody. So, <laughs> And my, my rule of thumb is you must have fun in my class or else. 
uh, or else we need to find you a different sport because this is a really, really fun sport. Next slide. So as we go into the MySSI app, <coughs> a few things to be aware of. At the upper right-hand corner is the little gear. Um, that's where you're going to do your syncing of your stuff. You're going to add in um, your headshot and go through and sign your safe diving waivers. waivers. At the bottom, there's a nice little thing that says courses, um, and uh, that's where you'll find your open water course. As you go into the gear, you'll start at personal data. From personal data, you'll go over and you'll be able to adjust that. Scroll all the way down, and you can hit edit. Edit um, your headshot. Here's the thing about your headshot. Please make one that looks like you with your face showing. If you put your child, if you put the dog or, or a dolphin, um, SSI will get upset at me, and then I have to get upset at you, and I don't actually get upset, but uh, I can't give you your certification until there's actually a headshot that looks like you. Absolutely. As long as it's your face, and I can kind of make it out that it's a person, it's kind of the general rule of thumb. Is, is the diver ID the same? No. But uh, uh, we'll get that a little bit. Under personal data, um, oh, how do we get back here? Oh, there we go. I was like, wait a minute, we, we're, we're off this. Yeah. Under sync and, um, in that same place, after you guys do your homework, go to sync and settings, scroll down to the bottom, and just hit sync all for me. If you do not, a lot of times it's caught up and it won't. Um, show on my side because for me to pass off your certification I have to have all this done and all your homework done so you have to look at every single page and take every single quiz good news quizzes if you take the quiz once and pass it fantastic you are a superstar if you take the go through the, and take the quiz 85 times and pass it congratulations you're a superstar I will not know how many times you passed or failed the test unless you tell me if you feel like sharing that information great if you don't feel like sharing that information great it's up to you completely i have no as long as you at some point pass the test pretty straightforward um, this is what it's going to look like for your open water make sure to go through and get all pretty little green bars it, once you have all pretty little green bars make sure to go back in and sync it as you go through this i would encourage watch the videos the videos um, will reiterate the stuff that's in the information as well um, but the videos are kind of nice they're um, pretty boring next slide Is this a video? Yes. There we go. Oh my God, skip past this, please. <laughs> Does anybody want to actually watch the safety video and fall asleep for 15 minutes? I'm okay with skipping the safety video. You actually don't, it's not required any longer. If you'd like to watch the safety video, it is in your app. You can absolutely watch it. It's 15 minutes. Um, it's, a, it's really great for poor bed. It'll put you right to sleep. Um, connecting with the SSI Dive Network, make sure you download the app. Um, the advantage of the SSI Dive system is there's going to be additional information. You'll have charts. You'll have um, your uh, everything that you need to be a safe diver will be in there. You'll also be able to log your dives um, for reward points, um, and you'll be able to keep track of your previous dives. This is a lot like... Um, being a pilot, right? You want to have a, a log of what happened and how things happened. I was wearing this wetsuit. I needed this much weight in salt water. I was wearing this kind of wetsuit in that water. It helps keep things fresh um, where you don't have to try and remember them as easily. Um, so you'll be able to be more proficient on dives. By the way, this is my little crew. Um, I'm on the left. My blushing bride is on the right. That's my son um, who I certified, my daughter um, in the middle um, out in Florida on a Christmas Eve dive that we did as a little crew. Some of the greatest joys and greatest happiest memories I have are diving with my wife or diving with my crew. Um, so I hope that you are able to have those kind of memories as well. Um, course standards. Study the manuals at home. If you guys would please, pretty please, have through at least chapter four done before Thursday. It should take you all about 30 minutes. It's really not rocket science. Um, and then before Monday, if you could have all six chapters done. They're not hard. It's pretty easy information. Study the material, watch the videos at home, complete the academic review. We're going to do some pool sessions and complete open water training dives together. Uh, by the way, we all start somewhere. This was my open water certification when I was a big goober too. Um, this was my first open water in the pool, and that's my actually getting open water certified. So we all start somewhere. We aren't born amazing technical diving instructors like me. <laughs> I started somewhere as a goober too. So it, it works, right? So I like to kind of show those off. I've got my... If, What's wrong with these two pictures, David? Picture number one, picture number two. 
What's, what's something that we would um, discourage divers from doing? Mask on the uh, front of the head. What does the mask on the front of the head mean? I'm, I'm, I'm panicked. Exactly. I've lost my tracker. So if you put your mask, push it up on your forehead, it's the first thing I'm going to figure is that you're in trouble. Um, I did not obviously know this at this time. I got certified at Ryrie, and this is me in a wetsuit getting certified at Ryrie. So don't do that. <laughs> Not only do you look like a goober, it looks much cooler to put it on the back of your head because you look like a scout sniper and then you're extra cool. But uh, it's just fun to do. All right, next slide. If you think this is a great class, please go onto Google and go onto Facebook and give us a good review. If you think this is the worst thing you've ever seen in your life, go onto Facebook and go onto um, Google and give us a review. All I can ask is that you be honest. That's the only thing I'll ever ask of anybody. If, if I've only earned four stars out of five, I may come to you and say, hey, what could I have done to earn that fifth star? Absolutely. I would like to know how I can improve, but we'd like and we live on reviews. So please, 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 please go to Google and go to Facebook and give us a review. Your reviews do count, and it helps us to be the best shop we possibly can be. All right. Aaron, you want to take it over from here? I have expectations? So... What do you guys want to get out of this besides being a scuba diver? <laughs> How about you? Remind me your name one more time. Uh, Darren. Darren? And remind me your name one more time. Michelle, what would you expect to get out of this class? <laughs> we can get you there. It'll take a while, but we could get you there. Look at pictures of cenotes in Mexico. Yep. They'll be sold. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yep. And it's I'm glad that you've got goals because that's going to give you a good path forward, right? That's going to what classes and what specialties do you take to get there? If you don't have a goal in mind, it's just now eh, I'll just take a bunch because I want to do more stuff. Good. <laughs> Well, that's awesome that you're doing that together. My wife doesn't even like scuba diving, let alone me going to caves and cave diving. So that can be a little hard sometimes when you guys are doing it together. That definitely helps you. And then Ian, what's what do you expect from this class? Yeah. Remind your name one more time. Ken. Ken, what do you expect from us um, as we teach you? I used to know some of the <laughs> And my family. Cool. So what kind of diving do you feel like you want to do? Um, I'm not really sure. Yeah, bright open water, kind of see where it go from there. Good. All right, so my expectations from you guys is to listen, do your homework, call me out if I say something wrong because I'm learning. So <laughs> if I'm not doing a good job or if I'm, you need something re-explained because it doesn't make sense, please ask questions because if I don't know that you're not understanding it, I can't teach it better. Next one. My expectation of you guys is to ask questions. <laughs> The more you ask questions, the less I have to ask you questions. So, And we will ask questions to make sure you understand material, especially things that we feel are very important. Because once again, the class is about having fun, but if you're not safe, you can't have fun. And if you don't feel like you're learning, we're not doing our job right. So, The fastest way to ruin a good day diving is to have somebody get hurt. Yep, definitely. All right.
You know, everyone has their own little, water. yeah. Some people have a trouble with the mask clearing. Like it just drives them nuts that when that water gets in their mask, they panic. We can get you over that because you'll get used to it. Some people, the ear squeeze or clearing your ears, doing that kind of stuff can be hard. Really, it just, if you're comfortable being in the water, and I loved it. The first day I got in there, I didn't want to get out. I just kept going and going and going because I loved it. Um, but there were a few things like I had trouble with my sinuses and then I ended up actually going to get sinus surgery because they were horrendous. I didn't realize how bad they were until I started diving. But that's something that affected me. And once I got that taken care of, now I can just go. I have fun. I love doing it. Um, really, there's nothing, unless you're absolutely scared of water, there's nothing that's going to be a big hindrance to you because we'll work through all those little, little things. But Ooh, Good way to lose a toe. Yeah. 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 And I guess, yeah, I didn't really think about that because I guess I've been doing it so long. So thanks for bringing that up, Nikki. So, yeah, you just got to remember air is coming through your mouth, right? <laughs> so. Um, class participation, we kind of went over that. You expect us to teach you. We expect you to be engaged. If you're just looking at your phone the whole time, you're not going to get much out of it, and then it's going to be harder for you to enjoy it. So um, you expect us to do a good job. We expect you to be good students, and then we can both have fun and get through this. All right, so course standards and procedures. Ben kind of talked about this in the classroom section. We're going to teach you about what we expect for you to be competent open water divers. So your responsibility code, you dive within the limits of your ability and training. So when we get done with this class, you'll be able to dive open water with a buddy to 60 feet. If someone says, hey, we're going on a dive boat, we're going to go do a 130 foot dive, what are you going to say? No, right? You're not trained to do that. If you do things outside of your training and your experience, this, you know, it's a, it's a harsh environment there that we're not meant to live in. We get to experience that with this scuba. Let's not go get ourselves killed, right? <laughs> so um, evaluate the conditions before every dive and make sure they fit your personal capabilities. So let's say you go out on a boat, it's choppy water, you're not feeling real good. Should you go do that dive? Mm, you may. I mean, if you don't, you can evaluate that on every dive, right? If I get out there and I'm not feeling good, I'm feeling sick, my head's plugged, I kind of got a cold, it's probably not going to end well when you start out with things that are problems. Um, there's plenty of ocean, 70% of the world's water, right? Where there's going to be another day. But if you ignore those, um, I guess, the, what you've learned, ignore how you feel, there might not be another day for you to go out and dive, right? So we evaluate every dive. Um, someone's going into a cave, you haven't done that before. You probably shouldn't do that. Um, be familiar with and check your equipment before and during each dive. This is especially important with rental gear. You don't have a clue who was there before you. Um, hopefully, you'll eventually have all your own gear that you can take with you. Besides the weight and tanks, it's not real heavy, so you can take it diving wherever you go. But always check the gear like flying a plane again, right? Checklist. Is my tank on? Is my regulator not leaking? Is my mask good? Is everything, if you start the dive with everything where it's supposed to be in really good shape, you're going to have a way better dive because those little problems seem to add up. We're going to respect the buddy system and its advantages. So as you begin open water diving, we always dive together. And the reason that is, is you've got a spare tank with feelings next to you, right? You can still his air. We'll go over that air sharing and stuff. But the buddy system, it's always funner to dive with people anyway. It's not real fun to go home and say, yeah, I went and saw all these cool things. Well, you get to go with people. You get to enjoy that. We're social creatures, right? I mean, 
Um, there are classes you can take to do solo diving, but right now you're not going to have those skills. When you get open water certified, you're open water, or you're certifying to be with a buddy. And that's what we're teaching you to. And then we can go on to classes where we can teach you to be self-reliant or solo divers. Um, accept the responsibility for my own well-being on every dive. So we're diving with a buddy, but whose responsibility is your safety? It's yours, right? You can't say, well, my buddy checked my gear and now I died. What good does that do you? Or my buddy checked my gear and forgot my boots, so now I don't have boots, you know. So ultimately, you're responsible for your own safe diving experience. Be environmentally cautious on each and every dive. This is important. We don't touch the wildlife. We don't touch the reefs. We're going to teach you to work on your buoyancy to where you can get close to see things but not run into them, not break stuff. We don't want to ruin all of this stuff we're seeing for other people. All right. So any concerns about open water diving? Anything you feel like, holy cow, I don't know if I can do this. I mean, you're all here, so you jumped the first big hurdle, right? Just getting here to sign up. Some of this stuff you might come to a realization after you're in the pool and go, oh, this isn't exactly what I thought, or this isn't. No big concerns, nobody? Yeah. Yeah, how about we just start back here, Ian? Oh, like decompression, decompression sickness. sickness, yeah. Sometimes it... We'll teach you how to yeah. clear those. That's something we definitely work on and we'll go over in, in class today. So, yeah. That's absolutely a huge concern. So we, we address that for every student. Yep. How about you? Um, I haven't used it. Yeah, a lot of these guys just got their gear tonight. So we're all basically treating everybody as if we're starting at point zero, right? We want to make sure that you're comfortable with the pace we're going. If you're not, say, hey, it's been a while. Stop for a second. Let me take care of this, right? Good. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very great concern. How do we use all this new stuff you just got, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. Oh, getting left, yeah. Yeah. That would be uh, a very big like concern. <laughs> if I had to fall overboard, I'd like to do it in scuba gear. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, definitely missing the boat would be a pain. You make good friends with all the people you go diving with so that someone will be like, hey, where did they go? <laughs> they won't leave you. Yep. All right, so these are all Ben's slides, so I'm sure that's... Oh, there's a video there. If you want to watch it, if not, we'll just keep going. We can watch it. Let's see what it is. One of the SSI ones or one of Ben's? It's one of Ben's. Okay. All right, so there's your boat. So. <laughs> yep. The GoPro stabilizing that motion, it's kicking a lot more than you'd think. <laughs> yeah, so. so that's one of those times if you weren't comfortable and you're like, dude, this is, I don't want to get back on the boat when this happens. Once you're down, once no. you're down in there, not as much, but you do have to get on and off the boat if you get injured or something getting on or off, that can ruin your day just as bad as. And this gear is not particularly light. 
Yeah. So, <laughs> yep. See, there is a little bit of current because they're floating away from the boat. That would be, that would be, that would be a concern I have is that uh, when somebody is uh, driving a boat or something, they notice the flag or. It's a very real concern, especially yeah. here in Idaho where people don't know what those dive flags mean. Yeah. Yeah, we'll have a lot of people drive up to your flag to see what it mean, you know, what it is. And you're like, ben had somebody grab his flag and try to drive off with him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. You can go ahead. And... All right. So, you said a little bit about getting off the boat. We don't want to bore you with an hour video of Ben diving. So, let's. Uh, you want to. Take this part. Sure. So total diving system, a lot of you guys got your equipment today. If it's all right with you, I'll use for you guys' stuff to demonstrate. Uh, so everybody starts with snorkeling system. You got a couple of different types. You got your, your standard J-tube that you probably played with as a kid where every time you dunk your head just a little too far, you get water up in your mouth and feel like you're dying. Um, they also have semi-dry and dry tube now. Um, it looks like you got the, the full dry where it has a valve both top and bottom to keep all the, the water out. It's an excellent choice. Um, makes it really easy to go under the water. You said you do free diving. You dive down with a, with a, with a full dry tube, come back, right back up and just start breathing. You don't have to purge your tube every time, which is super convenient. Um, exposure system, we talked a little bit about uh, dry suits, semi-dry and wetsuits. Uh, for the class, we provide wetsuits. If you're gonna be doing a lot of diving in Idaho, I recommend getting at least a semi-dry or even dry suit certification. Um, the dry suit certification, that's what he was showing you with the ice. It's awesome for the colder Idaho waters. It lets you dive a lot more than you normally would be able to with just a, a wet suit. Semi-dry, it just has a little bit more seal around the neck, the ankles and the wrists to keep that water from flushing through quite as fast. And that allows you to stay warmer because once you've warmed with the water inside the suit, you have a little bit of insulation uh, to keep you from the water. If you're only ever planning on diving in Bermuda, the Bahamas, you know, having yourself a good old time in those 85 degree waters, you'll be just fine with like a three millimeter wetsuit. Um, delivery system, that's your air. Probably the most single important part of your diving. You can dive blind. Um, you can dive without fins, all that stuff. Without air, you can't do much under the water, at least not for very long. <laughs> um, so when you have this on your back, does it cover this later down? Am I skipping ahead? Okay. Go ahead and we'll catch up on the, the thing. So purchasing equipment from authorized dealers, um, we encourage you to pur purchase from the shop, not just because we love the shop and we want to keep the shop here local. Uh, we like having accessibility to parts when things go wrong because things do go wrong. And we like being able to service the equipment. These aren't bulletproof. They will not last you forever. Um, anytime you're going on a big dive trip or anything like that, or at least once a year, I believe is the recommendation for most equipment, go ahead and get your equipment serviced because the only thing that will uh, ruin your day worse than not being able to dive is paying for a really expensive dive trip, getting there and having your equipment not work. Uh, so everything that the shop sells, the shop services, if you don't buy it from the shop, they may be able to service it, but we can't guarantee that because some brands won't work with uh, people who aren't their dealers. So always try to get your equipment from an authorized dealer. Even if it isn't this shop, get it from a shop, somebody who can service that equipment for you. Uh, buying stuff off of Amazon is great, especially if it's something that you know they would sell, they just can't get. But there's also a lot of things on Amazon that are not going to be wonderful, work wonderfully well for you. Uh, I got a dive light. I was like, awesome, this thing's super cheap. I'll give it a try. I opened it up, put the battery in it, screwed it back together, and as I screwed it back together, it tore the threads off. And so I never even got to put that in the water to see if it was actually waterproof. So sometimes it's worth it to just buy the right thing first. Uh, so snorkeling, we talked about the, the snorkel. Your mask is also very important. Uh, U3... I've all been talked to about masks tonight, and I'm assuming you have 
diving parents, you've dove over the mask before. Um, important features of a scuba mask versus a regular mask is this finger well here. Being able to pinch your nose is huge, and being able to cover your nose and have your nose and your eyes in one thing, that's going to help with your pressure equalization. You're gonna, we're going to teach you how to do that tonight. Um, we'll teach you a couple of different techniques to clear your ears. We'll talk about that mostly in the pool. Um, but everybody's gone over a mountain. Everybody's flown in an airplane at this point. And so there's everybody's experienced the ear pop before, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. That's the whole engagement thing. I need you guys to engage with me so I know you're paying attention. It's actually part of the standards. So um, number one way to clear your ears is to uh, pinch your nose, tilt your head up, and just breathe a little bit like you're trying to blow through your nose. Everybody go ahead and try that really quick. You should feel your ears give a little pop. Everybody feel that? Yep, yep, yep. No? Okay, so you're going to be one of the more complicated ones. I can do it this way. I prefer to just take my jaw and kind of jut it outwards, um, and that can, can clear my ears. Um, where you've done free diving, do you clear your ears in free diving? I haven't ever done free diving. You don't clear your ears? Okay, so we'll work with you um, in the pool to make sure you're clearing your ears. Uh, other things to talk about on masks. Uh, first off, they're called masks, not goggles. I always forget to say that, but that will make you sound more professional, like you actually know what you're doing. <laughs> um, the other thing, scuba masks have tempered glass. That's a really important thing. Um, any authorized scuba dealer will only sell tempered glass, so make sure if you're not buying um, from a shop or you're buying in Bermuda because you know, you broke your mask, lost your mask, the uh, lovely airline left your luggage in Kansas, whatever. Um, make sure you get tempered glass because that will withstand the pressures that you experience with scuba. And uh, scuba quality silicon seals is the, the last thing because you are going to be subjected to incredible amounts of pressure. We'll talk a lot more about that. But every 33 feet, the pressure double or the pressure increases by an entire atmosphere. So at 33 feet, you're double the pressure. At 66 feet, you triple the pressure, etc. <laughs> He's not even exaggerating. That's exactly what happens. <laughs> Ladies with shoes have nothing on Ben with scuba gear, so... Bring your own gear. We already got them. So, uh, squeeze. This is what he was talking about with the sinuses. Uh, so, in your body, you actually have four sets of sinuses. But uh, in addition to your sinuses, your ears, it also affects your lungs. And so, uh, there's a whole lot of fun things that we can do with pressure, but you don't want them to happen with you. One of the things we'll talk about is a deployable surface marker buoy. And if you inflate that halfway at 100 feet, by the time it hits the surface, it will have actually overpressured and blown air out because of how much the air expands as you go up and down. Uh, your ears, we talked about how to clear those. Your sinuses, you do not have a way to clear your sinuses other than just letting it happen. So if you have a cold, if you have a sinus condition, anything like that, 
do not go diving that day. It's not worth it. It's going to hurt. You'll feel a little bit of pressure right here, and then uh, that pressure will just keep building until it releases, and it does not feel very pleasant. Uh, your lungs are very sensitive. Your lungs can actually have an overexpansion injury, like what we were talking about earlier, in as little as four feet of water under the worst conditions. Is it likely? No, it's actually really hard to do. But in as little as four feet of water, you can have an overexpansion injury. <clears throat> One of you said you liked learning about how things work. I think it was you, right? Uh, an excellent class to take, Science of Diving, would dive way deep into all of that, everything that, that goes into the science of diving. And it's basically how the world works for scuba. <clears throat> and I, it's an excellent class. Ben's an awesome teacher. He loves the science of diving. If he could only teach one class, that'd probably be the one he picked, if I'm not mistaken, because he absolutely loves to talk about how things work. Uh, airplanes like we were talking about, Sorry, I, I tend to get ahead of things. I'm terrible at following <laughs> slides. So Dan.org, uh, Dan is the insurance. If uh, you want to grab the, the Dan cards and pass everybody a set of stickers. So if you plan on doing any diving, Dan is an excellent insurance to get a hold of. Uh, it's Divers Alert Network. It's incredibly cheap for what it is, and it will cover any diving-related injury or issue with your dive trip. So depending on which one you have, if you have any injuries, if you have anything happen on a dive trip, this is the insurance to take care of you. Um, as a, a dive shop, this is what we have. And most people who dive here at the shop will have this because it's a really cheap way to make sure that you're taken care of. Um, the overexpansion injuries, number one treatment for it is oxygen and a recompression chamber. Recompression chambers are available pretty much worldwide at this point. They're used pretty widely in car crashes even. Um, but, so overexpansion injury is, um, if you blow up a balloon too much and it pops, if you blow up too much air into your body, it will pop in, in the simplest of terms. We'll talk a lot more about that, I believe on day three, okay. Uh, and so on day three, we'll talk a lot more about the overexpansion injuries. Today, we're kind of keeping it introductory level, but we absolutely will cover more about that. But in the simplest of terms, it's when the air doesn't do what it's supposed to. You get too much air, you overexpand. Um, so according to Dan, who studies this kind of thing extensively, 89% of divers don't equalize the correct way. So not clearing your ears, not going down slow enough. If you go down slow enough, your body will equalize just fine all on its own. Problem is, we get in a hurry. We like to move faster than, than perhaps we should, and that's when things get in the way. Take your time. Do it right. Make sure you equalize your ears. 29% uh, of divers had to stay out of the water for weeks or months due to problems caused by equalizing. Uh, if you are having to force it coming down, you need to go really slow coming up because... Air compresses going down and air expands coming up. And so if you're having trouble equalizing going down, you're going to have trouble equalizing coming back up too. And you don't want to equalize by just letting that pressure flow through. 6.3% uh, of divers have gotten permanent ear damage due to problems equalizing ear pressure. It's a beautiful world. I like music. Let's protect your ears. Okay. Uh, equalization techniques. The Valsava technique is the one we, we tested where we just... Plug your nose and blow gently is their, their big thing. There's also the pinch your nose and swallow, pinch your nose, blow and swallow, pinch your nose, blow and push your jaw forward. I don't even have to pinch my nose for that one. I can just jump my jaw. Uh, pinch your nose and make the sound of the letter K. And then tense your throat and push your jaw forward, which is the voluntary tubal opening. That's the one that I use personally. One so, thing I would add to that, and it's on the slide, is most people pinch their nose, blow for one second. And didn't work. It may take a minute for you to slowly push that, get that, to equalize. Get that equalization yeah. added. So if it's not happening in one to two seconds, give it a little bit before you move on to something else. Pinch your nose, uh, pinch your nose, close, close your mouth, 
forcefully but gently exhale. Bear down and hold this for 10 to 15 seconds. Again, with scuba diving. Absolutely. So, pop quiz. 
when should you start to equalize? Close. You know, it starts to hurt. Once it, once it starts hurting, it's too late. It's not necessarily too late to equalize, but you're already hurting yourself. You should never hurt yourself, right? This isn't necessarily a masochistic sport. When should you start to equalize? Immediately. Immediately upon descent. As soon as you put your head underwater, start equalizing. And keep equalizing all the way down and all the way up. All right, more questions. Ken. Sinus squeeze can be prevented by? B. Sinus squeeze is the one you can't adjust. You can, you can equalize your ears with the Valsava technique, but sinus squeeze, number one answer, not diving with a cold. If you have a cold, your sinuses are going to be very uncomfortable while you're diving. Um, if you're somebody who has a sinus, a chronic sinus condition, sinus surgery is an option. Sudafed is also an excellent option. Uh, but do not dive with a cold. It's just not fun. Can I take over? So we kind of talked about what does on our ears and our Started in on the lower. So, can't hear me on the video. All right, so squeeze is caused by the pressure of the water on you. Oh. And I quiz right now. So. All right, well, we're quizzing some okay. more. <laughs> First symptom of a sinus squeeze is usually. Michelle. Anyone remember? See? Very good. Yep. Yep. So sinus. Oh, we're going over all. <laughs> if you want. All right. Let's go to the next quiz. You made me do all the quiz questions. During normal diving activities, divers should never exceed an ascent rate of. The answer is 30 feet per minute. I don't think we went over this. Did you skip a slide or two? I don't know. <laughs> nope. Yeah. Okay, so everyone, now we got to go do an activity. <laughs> so we're going here where there's room to walk. All right, so start right there at the carpet. Sit past you here. And 30 feet is about right here. So that should take you a full minute to walk. So that took you eight seconds. Way too fast. <laughs> way, way too fast. Mm hmm. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah. It could, yep. Yeah. So that was about 30 seconds. So Yeah, so it's going to be something that at the beginning you're going to watch your gauges. So you're at about 40 seconds right now. So we're not supposed to go through that 30 feet any faster than yep. one minute. So what you're trying to do is stop all of that pain from going down or coming up. You don't want to go shoot oh, straight okay. to the bottom. If you go up to the top, we can have those over expansion injuries or decompression injuries. So 30 feet per minute, it's a very slow rate. Like you said, we're not in a race here. Okay. So the difference between this and free diving, you have all the air in the world. Yeah. yeah. So once you get down there, you'll still have plenty of time to look around. Yeah. So just you'll see how slow 30 feet a minute is. It's pretty slow ascent, so you don't want to come up fast. You don't want to go down super fast. 
um, that can help you equalize. Because if you're just shooting down, all that pressure builds faster than you can build it up. Yeah. So. It's very easy to go faster than 30 feet. Yes. Yeah. But you don't want to do it. No. So. An excellent rule of thumb for the, the 30 feet, if you don't want to just stare at your gauge the whole time, never go up faster than your smallest bubble. Because you're going to be blowing bubbles that whole time. Uh, the simplest thing uh, to, to remember to look at is to look at your equipment every two minutes or every time you see something interesting. So check your check your gas supply, and if you get in that habit of every two minutes or every time you see something interesting, you're not going to have an issue with an out of gas emergency. You're not going to have an issue with staying down too long. You're going to avoid the terrible twos. So every time you see something interesting, but definitely get used to watching that computer, that gauge, and as you're going up, make sure you're sending slowly. Well, you can certainly try and look at the bubbles. The problem is it's a, it's a uh, uh, holdover from the 90s. We don't use that anymore. So make sure you're watching your computer as often as you can. And David kind of went over a little bit earlier the 30 feet thing. Every 33 feet of seawater and 34 feet of fresh water, we gain another atmosphere of pressure, right? Well, as we come back up, we lose that pressure, right? Now our bodies have more pressure inside of them. So the other thing, and this is probably the number one rule of diving, is always breathe so that we don't get injuries. So as we're coming up, don't concentrate so much on our diving gauge that we forget to breathe in and out. <laughs> it happens the first few times. So just remember, I've always got to breathe. I've got plenty of air. Um, but that ascent rate is so that it takes about a minute to get through each of those atmospheres of, uh, of pressure coming back up. Nope. So. All right, so now we'll go over, we kind of went over the snorkeling system, the snorkel. The purpose of the snorkel is so that we can be on the surface, kind of see some things without actually going under the water or free diving shallow materials. It's usually made out of a semi-hard plastic tube with soft um, silicone mouthpiece and usually has a tube at the, or a valve at the top to help water get out or stay out of it. Um, always breathe out of your snorkel when you come up from a dive just to make sure the water is cleared. What kind of snorkel? There's a semi-dry, a dry, and an open, I believe. J-tube. J-tube, yeah. What's the difference between a uh, J-tube and a semi-dry, for example? So the J-tube is just wide open to the water. Uh, semi-dry has um, just a slight, I think it's just a flapper on the top that kind of helps hold it. Where so the, the full dry. Full dry has an actual ball valve in it that seals up. It also has a vent at the bottom as well. Oh, okay. Okay, so all right, go to the next one. Your fins. You guys got new fins tonight, you gotta try them out. Why do we even carry these? What's the purpose of fins? Propulsion? Yeah. Right, so what would be in the purpose is to get us moving, right? We're not swimming with our arms. You're done. You're done swimming with your arms now. We're in. All your legs get to do the work now. So their purpose is to propel us through the water. Um, the materials they're usually made out of a fairly stiff sides, um, a rubber boot that fits over your water or whatever type of uh, boots you're wearing, and then uh, the fin system can either be split fins like these or a full hard fin if you're doing technical diving or stuff like that. So, so the two things we're looking for in fins is they maximize propulsion and minimize effort. Yep. Those are the two key words. And I'm not saying that they'll, that'll be on the test, but... Might be on the test. <laughs> okay. So there you go. Um, yeah. Okay, so the snorkeling system, your dive boots. Um, 
How comfortable would those fins be without boots on, bare feet? Not very. <laughs> yeah. Have any of you dove with the boot or the just the barefoot fins? Even the ones that are made for it, I don't think are really that comfortable. Some people do. Um, the other purpose of the uh, boots is keep your feet warm. You lose a lot of your body heat out of your hands, your head, and your feet. So if you can keep those things warm, it actually makes your dive a lot more comfortable and keeps you warm longer. Gloves and mitts, obviously hands again. There we go. If you don't want a full hood, get these little neoprene beanies, just something to keep, um, keep your head warm, make it more comfortable. Now, I can in, tell you for personal experience of doing 14, 18, 20 dives in Florida at, uh, where it's between 78 and 82 degrees. Um, hydrothermia is cumulative. It will get colder as the, as the week goes along. Something as dumb as that little two millimeter neoprene hood will help keep you a lot warmer throughout that week of that dive. And it, it makes an am amazing amount of difference just putting a stupid hood on um, will make and how much more comfortable your dives are. Remember, this is a comfort sport. Yep. So with water, and we may have gone over this a little bit, water, you lose body heat 20 to 30 times faster than air. So even with water that may be 80 degrees, there's still a chance of hypothermia, right? Any water that's lower than 98.6, which is our body temperature, is pulling heat out of our body. Our body burns calories to um, create that heat that we have. And so if you're colder, you're going to be shivering. You're going to be not as comfortable. So um, definitely dry or, you know, exposure protection is a great thing. Um, they're different materials. Most of the stuff is neoprene, which is lets water in. If you get into the dry stuff, then you'll have a lot of other materials that we can go over if you decide to do a dry suit class. The advantages of both, I guess, dry suit, if you have the proper thermal underwear on, keeps you, keeps the water off you. The point of a wetsuit is that you get the water inside the wetsuit, your body heats it, and it stays as a thermal barrier, the water inside the suit. So those are kind of the main differences between wet and dry. Purpose. So in salt water, there's not as much of, they call it a thermocline. It's where water changes temperature. Salt water tends not to have as much. Fresh water, they're very defined thermoclines. If you go to Ryrie, maybe 60 degrees on the surface at about 30 feet, it'll probably be 10 to 12 degrees colder than that at another. Yeah. And so, yeah, it's definitely colder the further down you go and the further or longer your dive is. Okay, exposure suits. We kind of went over this. This is gives you a good idea of what you should have. So if we're diving in Florida and it's 80 degrees outside, probably just a short three mil or two mil wetsuit will do the trick because you're not losing a ton of body heat. You're pretty close to your body's temperature. Um, below about 70 degrees, probably a full body. Then your legs aren't getting cold. Your arms aren't getting cold. A three mils, usually pretty good. Um, they say five mil for 60 degree down to 60 degrees, but that's that's pretty thin. You start diving Ryrie like we're gonna do, you probably want a six or seven mil suit. Um, temperatures of six, 50 to 60 degrees, that's when you get into the semi-dry that help keep water from moving through the suit so you can keep that warm water with you. And anything under about 55 degrees, you're probably gonna end up going with a dry suit if you're gonna do a lot of diving in that because you're just going to be more comfortable. You're going to be warmer. Um, that's, so if you're going to dive in Idaho, you're probably going to end up with a dry suit at some point because you'll get tired of all that cold water coming in. Um, we do teach the dry suit class. So we can get you set up. So, so Aaron, is, uh, what are some other advantages to wearing a wetsuit? Pee in your wetsuit. <laughs> there are two types of divers. Yep. There's ones that pee in their wetsuits, and there's the ones that lie about it. Yep. I'm just going to put that out there. But how about uh, um, increased thermal protection for reduced reduction of potential dive injuries? Yeah. So dry suit, you're definitely going to be warmer. You're going to have air around you instead of cold water. 
Um, what's that? Abrasion protection, yeah. So How about flotation. What happens yeah. if you had a, a catastrophic failure of your PC? Would would a, a wetsuit float? It does. It is buoyant, somewhat. Not as much as a dry suit. I guess if you can put air into the dry suit, you can make it buoyant. Sure, but which would be more buoyant, my my uh, swimsuit or a yeah. three mil wetsuit? Well, a three mil wetsuit definitely has more buoyancy in it. Versus One of the things just... I encourage is I, I see those pity pill out in Florida that go out. It's eighty two degrees. I'm gonna dive into my 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 swimmy suit because I look sexy in my swimmy suit, you know. And you see the girls in their little bikinis because they want to show off all the skin. And um, if there's a catastrophic failure or they but they get left like you mentioned, um, they ha or whatever, and they need additional flotation. There, that that little stringy bikini um, does not float one one damn bit, and uh, my my cool uh, uh, board shorts don't float either. So having a little bit of extra flotation is definitely to your advantage. Um, having the protection around you, because um, there are things that will sting you, rub you, touch you, um, poke you uh, while you're underwater. Having a wetsuit definitely helps with that as well, but also helps keep you warmer, so it makes your dive dives yeah. safer as well. So there's a lot of uh, definitely yeah. Uh, more than just thermal advantage. More than just thermal advantage. So the right exposure suit is going to keep you more comfortable. Care and maintenance. Can we just get out of the water and throw them on the ground? No. So, yeah. So we definitely want to. if you pee in it. <laughs> So uh, when we get out of especially salt water, get them rinsed, hang them up where they can dry so they don't um, prematurely wear out or have problems with them. Um, it's just like any of your gear. You've spent a lot of money on it. Take care of it, and it'll last you a long time. Okay, delivery system. So we'll go over all the parts of the regulator. David kind of just showed you what it is. So... In addition to our tank, this is our air delivery system. So the first stage is this big, heavy thing right here in the middle. This is what connects it to the tank. Um, and what it does is those cylinders are usually around 3,000 PSI, depending on which size cylinder you have. So that's a lot of air to breathe. If that went straight in your mouth, it'd blow you up like a balloon. So this takes that 3,000 PSI and hands it out to a, a manageable um, 120 to 130 PSI so that it breathes well. The second stage is where that goes into your mouth. So the second stage is going to, it's called an on-demand regulator, where it doesn't push air out until you breathe on it. So as you breathe in, it opens a valve and then air is delivered to you. You breathe out, the air goes out the exhaust port. Um, most of the systems we have here have what they call a, they say alternate air source. We call them an octopus most of the time. A second one in case you have a failure, right? We want redundancy. If your skirt rips or something happens and you're getting water, you can take this, or if you have to share air with a buddy. So that's why there, you'll see two of those second stages on. And typically, you'll see a yellow hose or a different color hose for that so that people, you know, as you're diving, it's easy to say, okay, that's my spare. Um, low pressure inflator hose. This is how you're going to inflate that BC, your BC or buoyancy compensator. I know we throw out that, we all use those acronyms, right? Nobody knows what they mean. So a buoyancy compensator, that's what's going to be your like balloon to help get you to the surface. So you've got to have some way to get air into that. This is just a quick connector valve um, on your buoyancy compensator. It connects to, let's throw that on connects here to that valve. And as we're setting up our gear, make sure that's connected really well. But that's what that um, low pressure inflator hose. And if you have a dry suit, you'd have one on the other side to go to your dry suit as well to inflate that. So those are all the parts. We'll go over those in detail as we set up um, our gear, how to check all of those. The other thing that's not listed on there is your... It's coming. Oh, is it coming? Okay. Okay. All right. So we'll go to the next one. That's the tank. So these are our cylinders. Um, scuba cylinders typically come in. Most of them that you'll see are 80 cubic foot aluminum tanks. That's what most of the ones at the shop are that you'll rent. They do come in steel. Um, 
So these are some of the markings for the DOT. You know, in America or US, you'll see DOT. There's an aluminum cylinder. Um, you'll see the markings on the corner or on the shoulder of the tank. This will tell you what it's made of. Number three, aluminum, 3,000 PSI. That's important to make sure that you're not using the wrong pressure in the cylinders. Um, this is the number that they put on the tank for identification, the manufacture date, um, and the, or the hydrostatic date. So a lot of these cylinders, you'll see a bunch of dates on them. You know, it's hard to see here, but once you get a tank, those are the dates it was retested. And that's important that it's done every five years so that you don't have a tank blow up on you. And What's then, that DOT mean? Department of Transportation in what the it U.S. What does though? And so in Canada, you'd see Transportation Canada or TC instead of DOT. Some of them have both. You'll see TC or DOT on them. So that's all that that means. It's just by which. And then in other countries, they may have other Transportation Department or government markings on them. But probably the most important thing to, for you guys starting out is the PSI, what pressure it is, um, when the last hydrostatic date is, and then this is it's a uh, 80 cubic feet. So that'll tell you the size of the tank. Um, pretty straightforward. Oh, visual inspection. Uh, visual inspection should happen every year, so there's be a sticker that should tell you when it was visually inspected. Oh, there it is. So annual inspection is completed. So the month and the year, um, so 20, you know, 2011, it'll tell you what year, when it was inspected. What that's going to make sure is that the valve's in good shape, the O-rings and everything have been changed, and there's no problems that they see inside the tank. Um, that's required so that you don't have, you don't want a valve failure. Another way to lose your air, so... Those are the two things to check with the tank that it's in date for hydrostatic testing and for visual inspection. One other thing to point out on here, they've got the OTC. The OTC is for when you're driving your next stop. Last was the registration. Here the test is at. Here at the end of that test. 100 bucks. Hey, let's, let's talk about that for just a moment if you wouldn't mind. Okay. So in this class, who would like to be able to dive more safely than just generally general safety? Who, who wants to do it dive more safely? Raise your hand. It's, it's okay. There's, it's not a trick. It's, it's not. A, it's not a trick question. Who would like to have more bottom time on their dives? Be able to stay down longer. Who would like more energy after their dives? Who would like to have to stay on the surface for less amount of times between dives? Does any of that? If does any of those? If one of those sounds interesting, then nitrox is for you. If multiples are, then I would strongly encourage you to take the nitrox course. What nitrox is, is a higher percentage of oxygen that you can dive. It's available at most dive resorts that you'll ever go to. It's even available in Australia because they're upside down. I get it. Um, but um, <laughs> if that's interesting to you, we can add that as part of this class. It is a about a two-hour class. Um, I prefer to do it online where you guys can sit at home and have cookies and in and, and your jammies. Um, and relax. We do it virtually, um, and uh, it is a, uh, a simple test, and it's a hundred dollar add-on to this class. Um, if we can get it done before um, open water on day two, I will have you guys dive nitrox on day two of your dives. Um, honestly, you won't notice any difference because we're not going that deep or that long, but you'll have that chance to dive nitrox. Once you get the nitrox certification, it's it's good as long as you're diving, um, and uh, you're able to rent nitrox up to forty percent wherever you're at. So. If you're interested in that, please let me know after the class, and we'll get you signed up for nitrox as well. Yeah. And like I said, I, I we can you guys can certainly come into the shop. I Aaron will tell you I really like teaching for going with my polo and my jammies uh, bottoms on from my my home office, um, and I do that <laughs> a lot. He's taken quite a few courses where he's sat in his jammies too. Yep. Um, it's a great way to do it. Um, you guys could do it from home from your phone. Just pay attention. There's homework. It's not rocket science to do, but I I strongly 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 encourage it. Uh, yep. Normally, especially it's 150 bucks. It's 100 bucks with this class. Yeah. So, if you do that class and you do get nitrox, then that becomes important that they've cleaned it for oxygen service. Um, so, buoyancy compensator. We can go over all the parts of that. So, we kind of talked about the low pressure inflator. Um, what that's going to allow you to do is inflate or deflate your BC. Um, 
it's just like a backpack. You can have waist straps, shoulder straps, they're adjustable to fit. Um, it's important you find one that's not super small. If I tried to wear this one, it would look it's, really Aaron's funny. Aaron's pretty cute in that one, though. I've seen him try and wear that. I don't know that I could even get it on with a, cute. a wetsuit on because it's so small. So I think that's oceans. Make, make sure it fits. Uh, make sure the parts are in good shape. But So the first part is that inflator valve. Overpressure relief valve. You've got one on your shoulder and one on the bottom usually. What those are going to do is let's say you fill it too full or you're at the bottom and you're coming up and we expand like that balloon, those are going to be able to release that pressure without just popping it because that would be a terrible thing, right? Um, dump valves, most of the inflator valves have dump valves just because they multi-purpose them. Um, weight pockets. Used to be that we had to wear these old, horrible weight belts. And as you get older, especially men, you don't have hips or anything to hold them up. Your pants fall down, same with your weight belt. So they've started doing most of these as integrated weight pockets. So the reason they do them that way instead of just a pocket with a zipper is you want to be able to dump your weight if you have an emergency. So they've made it pretty simple to, instead of trying to find a weight belt and get rid of it, you've just got a weight system that holds in place. If you need to get rid of them, you just pull them and get rid of them. D-rings. I notice a lot of the new ones will have a lot more of these D-rings. That's clip your flashlight, a dive knife, um, your compass and all of that. All of that stuff, you can clip it up to it so it's not dangling around. Because one of our uh, responsibilities is not to damage the environment. So if we're dangling all these hoses and things on the ground, we may hit the reef. We may cause, in addition to getting stuck on things, um, so D-rings to connect some of our equipment. All right, and then I don't know why that, that slide should be first because then I have the regulator already on me. <laughs> and this is our information system. And so as Ben was mentioning, we have usually three pretty typical. This is our pressure gauge. That's going to tell us how much is left in our tank. Um, we have a depth gauge. That's going to tell us how deep we are. And then a compass so we can navigate. Um, not hard to do in the pool because it's not very big, but you get out in the big wide ocean and you know the current's flowing southwest and you need to go back up to the boat, you probably need to know how to read a compass. Um, once you get more advanced, and I would say just to get a computer to start off just because it makes life so much easier. So a dive computer, this is an Eon Steel, I believe. Core. Oh, that's the core, yeah. So the dive computers, they take the, all the science out of it as we begin, we'll learn how the science works so we know what the computer's doing. But something as simple as just a normal dive computer will tell you your depth. Um, if they're integrated into the hose, they'll tell you your pressure. They'll also tell you if you're going down too fast, up too fast, the temperature of the water. There's a lot of information there. So I recommend dive computers. I have something that's simple as a Garmin Descent. So this one does all the diving, plus I get my text messages and notifications on it. So it doesn't have to be so brand new. I think they're probably around $900 to $1,000. I know some of the nicer, what was your Mark 1 or 2? $1,500. Um, so something like a, you're looking at that Eon Core uh, um, is a great computer. It's a, um, it does a fantastic job. I liked it when Nikki had one because I could be from um, almost me to Aaron, and I knew how much air she had. Um, it was that big and that bright. It was, it, yeah. it, that's a bit of an or exaggeration, but it's not too far off yeah. either. But what they do is they measure the, and keep track of your individual nitrogen. Each person should have their own computer as well. But something like that, you're looking at about 900 uh, for a computer yeah. like that. On the right-hand side is the same basic computer in a watch style. Um, yeah. That's called the D5, and I believe that those go for 750. Um, yeah. And they do take text messages and things like that as well. Uh, the one just to the right of the watch style, um, that's your Aqualung i770. Um, that's another great computer as well. Aqualung makes a solid product um, as well. And uh, it's air integrated and wrist mounted as well. Um, mm -hmm. The next one in between that has the hose, that's a uh, Aqualung i550. Nikki still dives that on her student, her teaching rig. Um, it's as close to bulletproof as you're going to get for a dive computer. Um, it is um, not... It's air integrated, but it's ho off a hose. Off a hose. So it's a piece that comes off. Whereas the other th uh, three examples that we have on there, 
um, you put a pod on your first stage and you're able to read everything on your computer directly. Um, it's one of the things that I definitely encourage. Buy the nicest computer you can you can possibly afford. Add 20% to what you can afford. Um, that way you don't out, outgrow it. It's just better, I promise you, because um, Aaron's been through this. I've been through this. Nikki's been through this. Many, um, a lot of us went through this process where we bought that entry-level computer, and then we ended up buying a nicer computer down the road, and now Nikki uses an i550 as a uh, teaching computer. Um, I use a Pro Plus 3 as a teaching computer. Um, so that was my, my pro plus three was about 600 bucks. Um, I didn't need it. Um, I, I outgrew it in about six months. So buy the nicest computer you can possibly afford, add 10% to that, that mark and, and get one that you won't outgrow. Um, the core, the 770 and, uh, the uh, D5 are ones you most likely won't outgrow. They're great computers. Um, Nikki did outgrow her, her, uh, Eon core, but we also do some very, very, very big diving. Um, that is, just, it just really, for the level of diving uh, with three to four tanks, it just wasn't really designed for that. So and that's where knowing where you're going in diving is important. Mm -hmm. If all you ever want to do is nice warm water Caribbean dives and that's your thing, you probably wouldn't outgrow those very much. If you're, you know, right now you're going into tech, you're going to do something, cave diving. You're going to, and the nice thing is if you get that nice computer, you, you, you figure out how it works. You get all that used to how it's going to work, your air integration, all of that stuff. And then you don't have to switch from something here to something else. In addition to, well, I spent 500 on a computer. Now I got to go spend 1800 on a computer. And that $500 computer is either going to go on eBay or in your closet. Every Probably on eBay. works a little different. Anybody yeah. ever made a switch from Mac to PC or PC to Mac? You had, it's a, there's a learning curve. Every one of these computers runs a little differently. <laughs> yep. The D5 and the Eon Core use the same software, but the stuff is in different places and it's different button pushes to get there. Yep. So it takes a moment. I just, I recently, um, I'm on my fourth type of computer. I started with a Pro Plus 3. I went to something called a Shearwater. I bought another Shearwater um, and then uh, gave my second Shearwater to my wife and I went to the Mark II uh, Garmin, uh, which is air integrated. And now I'm on the Apex DS, uh, DSX as well. So I use a Shearwater, a, Mark, a Garmin, and a DSX. I like the DSX the best out of all of them, really, for what for everything. But you'd think at, at the point of going from three or four different computers and having used the Eon, that the new DSX, I'd be like, okay, no problem. Throw it on my wrist and understand it perfectly. It doesn't yep. work like that. Um, I started with the pool, and I was like, oh, wait a minute. Where's this? Where's that? Where's this? Yep. Where's that? Where's this? And then I took it to open water um, and did some big dives with it where I had a second computer. And then I was like, oh, wait a minute. I, and so you had to figure out where stuff was at. And I promise you, on a big, on your first dive or a big dive, you don't want to be out there trying to figure out where stuff's at. So practice with it, learn it. And because every one of them works a little differently. It's, it really is almost like going from Mac to PC to Mac to PC to Linux. I mean, Some of them great. have really good compasses as well. Mm -hmm. It's a digital compass, so they're not perfect. That's why I typically have a, an extra or a manual pressure gauge and a compass on so that I know if something happens, computers are computers, right? They have bugs, they can die, something can happen. That's where that, just a manual pressure gauge and compass can help you out a lot. you need something to be able to see so here there's two things to be aware of is where should you get prescription fit into your glass into your mask absolutely if you're if your eyesight is that bad you can the other thing is is um if as you look at my shearwater uh, or this you think you're like oh my goodness the, the hand dials are so small to look at there's a magnification every guy loves diving because everything looks um 25 closer and 25 percent larger so when your husband comes back from his dive, and he says, I saw a fish this big. It was this big, right? <laughs> I promise you that we've uh, all been out to Ryrie. We've seen these crawdads. We come up with stories of crawdads that are this big. They're about this big, right? They're, they're good size, but they're yeah. much smaller. So the nice does... thing is, is with the, with the magnification um, that you're going to be seeing, everything being 33% closer and 33% 3 larger, um, it's easier to see. You get an instant magnification, almost instant reading glasses. 
But if that's not enough, you can absolutely order a prescription for your mask. Yep. It's a great question, though. That's what I really liked about that Eon. That Eon uh, core was uh, a really great computer because like I, I, I like to joke, but Nikki will tell you that um, I could literally be from here to Nikki and I knew how much air she was at because I just had to look over at her wrist and I could see her computer. It was, it was that nice. Yeah. I like the same thing. I've had people, the way that I have it set is I've had it set so that across my body and I can look around and there's a computer and the numbers are like really nice and big. That was originally why I bought the Pro Plus 3 because it had the largest numbers on the market of anyone. You could see I was worried about that. Um, the numbers are literally an inch and a half large for the gas. Um, and I've never needed it that large. I, I can see the, the gas on this. Um, and you can see it's substantially smaller. The, the numbers are about a quarter inch at best. Um, but with the 33% magnification, uh, there's times on the surface I have a hard time seeing some of the information. Once we get to diving, I've never had a problem. And I wear reading glasses, so. And definitely if you get out in the water and we do this and you're like, you know what, I just can't see it, then order lenses for your that glue into your um, mask. Yep. Definitely there are options if you need yeah, that. Yeah, there's plenty of options. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, Some, someday we'll all get there, right? <laughs> yep. Okay. So, um, David talked a little bit about the equipment service program. So when we buy equipment at a certified shop, you can bring it in, have it serviced, and know that it's going to be ready for you to use. You know that the parts they're using are good quality, that they know what they're doing. They've been trained to rebuild regulators, BCs, all of those things, so that you don't have a problem when you're out diving get those problems taken care of um, and you'll know that they're taken care of by a, a qualified person. So ad adaptation to the aquatic environment. So we are not built to live underwater, right? Otherwise we would be, we'd have gills and we wouldn't need scuba gear. We could just go swimming. So it's a foreign environment to us. And so there's a lot of things that we'd take for granted here on the surface that may not always be underwater. So um, light travels differently underwater. Um, one of the things you'll notice is that when you get to about 15 to 20 feet, you're going to lose a lot of the reds in there because the water filters out those colors. Um, so what we see underwater is once we get down to about 30 feet, you're going to lose a lot of the red. Um, once we get to about 60 feet, you're going to lose some of the, uh, and I'm colorblind, so this is a hard one for me to teach. But yeah, so. Your oranges, um, greens, blues, the longest one is obviously your um, purples or violet because um, they're the shortest wavelength, so they go further. Um, we're also, Ben talked a little bit about that vision, magnification. So we see things that are less color. And this is one reason why even in daylight dives, I'll carry a light because having that ultraviolet or that light source with you that's not filtered through all of that water can if you're doing photography it's definitely important but just to be able to see because you get down there you're going to have less light and not all the colors if you take your own light with you it can help you see better um, that way you're not seeing this kind of bland palette of everything right if you're looking for something you're going down there to spear fish or do something like that it's going to help you see the fish better and know oh, that's not the right fish i shouldn't be shooting him um, um, accessory systems, so that's when you, you talk about lights, cameras, obviously 
that's made up. We don't have systems for our dogs to go diving with us, although that would be cool. <laughs> so our accessories are, are things. <laughs> oh, yeah. That guy, can he can run 50 miles an hour, my German short-haired pointer. I wonder how well he'd do underwater. Um, accessories, you know, this is the stuff that keeps us alive. The accessories are what makes things fun. That's when you take your camera, your light, your knife, all those things that you're going to use to make diving even better experience. All right, so oh, go back go back. To that. so your dive light. Yep. Real quick on this. Interestingly enough, notice how that light is starting to turn blue. That uh, that thing on my wrist. Um, this looks, right here. That thing right there. Um, there's a little bit of Nikki's light that's coming, uh, that's uh, shining on me, and that's why it's starting to come back. But that light is hot pink. Um, I, I love that light, but I've got photos where there's no light on it at all, and it looks blue. So it just gives you a good example of how you start to lose colors. Having a dive light is, in my opinion, uh, one of the things that makes diving a lot nicer. You're able to look into the, into the pukas, the little hidey holes where all the cool stuff hides mm -hmm. uh, with light, but it'll bring the colors back. If not, um, you're, what you're going to see is a lot of technicolor blue. Uh, everything's going to look blue until you put, shine a light on it. There's more than once I've been chasing after a fish that I thought it was really cool, um, and he was blue until I put my light on him, and he was yellow or orange or purple or something else. Yep. So light's important. We went over that a little bit. Dive bag um, for all like the cool things or when you're picking up garbage because we all take care of the environment. It's going to have... Stuff we're looking for like a yard sale. Yeah, so you can keep everything together. That's what all those D-rings and all that. Spare items, things that you might need, a knife, a carabiner some things like that you can have with you that um, your spare mask just in case something happens. Um, but all of those things make diving more fun. You don't have to, oh, I wish I had this. I wish I had a light. I wish I had a camera with me. Those things can all be stored in those bags or spare items that you have. So we've said it, I think, six times now, and I... If I remember right, the standard is 45 times. First rule of scuba, say it. Out loud. You got to say it too. Did you? Okay. Say it louder. Absolutely. Second rule of scuba, ascend slowly and maintain control. And third rule of scuba, you guys already got this down. Never dive alone or beyond your level of training. That safe diver code that we read off at the beginning, this, the six things, you guys are each responsible for that. We're responsible to teach you that. You're responsible to live it. Uh, proper breathing pattern. Breathing should always be slow and relaxed. An efficient breathing pattern is balanced and rhythmic. And the delivery system, this is really important to remember, it will provide you all the air that you need as long as you keep an eye on your gauge. Okay? It's going to be super weird for you transitioning from free diving, but you get to breathe all you want. Breathe continuously the entire time. Do not try to conserve air by holding your breath. That's a great way to get injured. But when you breathe, breathe all the way in, breathe all the way out. Breathe all the way in, breathe all the way out. Slow and rhythmic. Doesn't need to be super fast. Doesn't need to be super slow. Just breathe continuously all the time. Okay, so we're getting ready to get in the pool. We've got some hand signals. This clown. <laughs> so these are real signals. These are not real things. Um, important signals to know. The next slide in. He's got the real ones on there. Okay. What does this mean? I'm okay. If any instructor ever gives you this signal, it's a question. I need you to give it back. Are you okay? Are you okay? Are you okay? Are you okay? What does this signal mean? Go up. This does not mean okay. This means we need to end the dive, get up to the surface. Okay? So if you see this signal, this is not, hey, you're doing great. This is you're doing great. This is let's get out of the water. Okay? If you see this at 60 feet, we're going to take our time to get there, but we're heading straight for the surface. That means something's wrong. We need to get out of the water. Uh, not okay. Something's wrong. Okay? 
You can further amplify this by telling me what's wrong. My ears are weird. My mask is weird. My regulator's weird. My stomach doesn't feel weird. My dive buddy's a little weird, right? Okay. Uh, come up a little bit. Go down a little bit. Okay on the surface. Because you're going to be usually signaling somebody on a boat or a dock, they're not going to necessarily see this. You're going to be small. You're going to be far away. You saw how fast that boat ran away from them, right? Uh, okay on the surface. You're going to do full out, and you're just going to touch the top of your head. That's I'm okay. Everybody do that for me. So when we get into the pool tonight, we're going to get into the pool. And you're going to turn around. You're going to signal to your, your surface guy that you're okay. Okay? And then... Help on the surface. I'm not familiar with that signal. Just this one. Okay. So. Get attention. Perfect. All right. Go down. Or. Go down. Yep. Go up. Good. End the dive. End the dive. Well, that's, that's cut. And the dive. I'm okay. Both signals. You could use the short straw. Okay. And the dive is thumbs up. Thumbs up means let's end the dive. We're going to the surface. So let's talk about end the dive for just a minute, if you wouldn't mind. Okay. So one of the things I need you guys to understand, there's no consequences at any time for ending a dive. You can end a dive for any reason at any time with no consequence. And here's why. And here's what it looks like. So, I forget your first name. I'm so sorry. Michelle. Michelle, thank you. Michelle Benjamin. So, Michelle, you and I decided we left him at home. Um, we're going to truck. Because we're now, we're like uh, best besties of all time, right? We're like, we're like this or Simpatico, right? And so we're hanging out. We go to truck, about a $10,000 trip. We go out and, and uh, you know that I'm a much more experienced diver. We go down, we're down for three minutes. And you say, and we come to the surface. And I come to the surface, and I'm, come on, and I throw my little man fit, right? Like we've seen some of those idiots on the, on the freeway. Do it. Why is your, uh, uh. if you have a problem on the second dive, how likely will you be to tell me about anything? If, exactly. And that's why it's important to understand that there is no consequence at all. Now, certainly, I may ask, hey, what's going on? Are you okay? Now, here's the thing I can tell you, and I've talked to a lot of world-class divers. Um, Jill Heinrich is one of them, uh, one of my heroes, and and I did an interview on our little channel with it. She will tell you flat out that she calls dives all the time, and she's a world class cave diver. Uh, and I've written books, got videos, documentaries out the wazoo, and tons of award women's diver hall of fame. She calls dives all the time. It's okay to call a dive. We are on planet what? Earth. You sure? Planet water. There we go. We're on planet water. I, I say when there's 70% of the, the surface of our planet is water, we're on planet water with a little bit of earth. So the ocean will be there tomorrow. The rivers will be there tomorrow. I would like you to be there tomorrow to enjoy them too. So that's the key th with this is, is if you're not feeling a dive, call the dive. Um, one of the proudest moments was with one of my students uh, over the wintertime. Uh, we got him in the, the ice hole. Um, this guy's a former Marine. He just got out of the service six months ago, lists weights and kind of buck stud, you know, Donnie's, he's ripped and he's ripped and shredded all that fun stuff. Got in the hole, went down for about a minute, came back up, says, I'm not feeling it, man. I need to go ahead and pull out of the hole and go get warm. I gave him a fist bump. I was like, yes, I am so proud of you. And if you guys call a dive, I will do the same thing. I'll pat you on the back, give you the fist bump. Thank you. Thank you for uh, recognizing that safety is more important than anything else we'll ever do. I want you to come back and enjoy this tomorrow. So, no consequence. I will promise you that if something's going on, um, now I may not be able to pass you. Of course, if you don't do the dives, right? I have. There's certain criteria I have to do, but I promise you, I will be here. Well, I I've got a high likelihood of being here next week and the week after as well to be able to get you through your water at another time. But I promise you, even if I'm not here, there's another instructor who will be, and I promise you, the water will be here tomorrow, the next day. So take your time. Be gentle and kind to yourself. Enjoy what you're doing. Don't be afraid. If you ain't feeling it, you know, certainly talk to us. If it's, if it's, you know, love your fears is what uh, one of my, one of my other idols says. You know, if, if you don't know how to fight, well, that's a real, 
a skill issue. We can work through that. I can teach you the skills. But if it's something that's else that I think there's a shark in Ryrie and I don't like sharks. Well, we can talk through that. We can work through that. I promise you there's no sharks in Ryrie, right? And, I, and we can work through that. If it's, if it's an irrational fear that we can talk about and work through, we're absolutely going to try to do that. But if it's a real, I'm feeling sick today, my ears are plugged up, I got in the water, my equilibrium was off, and I felt dizzy, whatever it is, it's okay. I promise you, I'm not going to judge you at all. And if my dive guides uh, judge you at all, let me know because I'll take them out behind the woodshed. No, <laughs> I'll have a talk with them. And, I, and they've been with me long enough to know that um, they won't, you won't have consequences from anybody in our group. It doesn't happen. It won't happen. This is a safe zone. I don't, I don't accept that kind of behavior, period. So please, please, please let us know how you feel. This is the most self-aware sport you will ever be a part of. How you feel going in the water is how you should be coming out of the water, right? Except maybe a little bit more excited because I saw a shark today. You know, whatever it was, right? That's, that's always the hope is we see a shark or we see a nudibranch. Those are the two things that Nikki and I hunt for the most is nudibranches and, and sharks. We're like, ah, oh, yes. And then the, the other cool stuff out there like, you know, coral shrimp. We, we like small things. We like, I like eels because I always say they look like they just told a dad joke and they're waiting for you to get the punchline. You know, so that's the, that's, you should come out more excited than when you came in. But if you have aches, pain, dizziness, uh, nausea, anything like that, it's your body telling you something. Please be kind to yourself and, and be aware of what that's trying to tell you, right? Fair enough? Need a fist bump on that? Double fist bump here. Shh. Go get him, Tiger. Okay, rapid fire round. Uh, I'm a dive. Just kidding, we haven't got that far yet. <laughs> um, okay, so it doesn't have it on there. The other big one that we'll, we'll use a lot, especially while you guys are students, and this is especially important for you and your buddy to establish, is this is check your pressure. I need to know how much pressure you have. This is going to be a question from all your instructors. We're going to ask how much pressure you have. On your hand, you have five fingers. So you got one, two, three, four, five, right? On the back, Turned sideways, you've got six, seven, eight, nine, and we don't have ten, but we do have zero. Okay? So, if anybody asks you, what's your gauge pressure? You're going to look at your gauge. You're probably going to be somewhere around 2,400 PSI. So, you're going to say, I'm 2,4. Or if you're 2,700, 2,7. Okay? So, that's a really important one. I need to know how much air you have. Uh... And I think that's all the signals we'll have for today. You'll learn more signals as we go. Um, and especially where you guys are diving with each other, these guys have signals all the time between them that nobody else will understand. They can have a full-blown conversation under the water. I'm sure you'll get there between you two as well. Um, but the people you dive with learn and establish signals so that you guys can communicate better because the better you can, can communicate under the water, the more fun you're going to have. Should we, should we challenge... Uh... David, to uh, some, sig some signals. There's a signal assigned for almost everything. So, David and I, you and I are diving along, and I give you... Sea turtle. Lobster. Crab. Seahorse. Drumfish. Hookfish. Scorpion fish. Scorpion fish. Rockfish. There you go. See? I'm learning. I haven't seen any of those yet, but... Or my personal favorite is. <laughs> Look behind you. You're screwed. There's a shark. <laughs> There's a... <laughs> Remember, you don't have to outswim the shark. You just have to outswim your buddy. <laughs> okay. Uh, we'll go ahead and skip that video. That's just the hand signals we've been reviewing. Um, Ben talked about the mentorship program. If you decide that diving is something you want to do, a great way to do it is to do it professionally because eventually, hopefully, maybe you might make a few dollars. You'll never recoup your costs. This is an expensive sport. But uh, Master Diver, that's once you've hit, I believe it's 50 dives. It's been a while since I reviewed the exact numbers. But Master Diver is 50 dives and three specialties, four specialties, excuse me, 
uh, and one of those has to be stress and rescue. That is my favorite class. All these other classes, they're great. Science of Diving's Ben's specialty that he pushes a lot, I push the stress and rescue class. That is a very great one because things do go wrong. Inevitably, it doesn't matter what you're doing. Everybody's broken down in a car, unless you have way more money than I ever will. <laughs> um, everybody's had an issue somewhere, and diving is no, no different. Eventually, something is going to go wrong. Uh, on my last dive, I actually had my regulator freeze open. So I was diving along. I was diving a way oversized tank. Had a ton of extra air on me. I was looking forward to a really long dive in the coldest water you could imagine. I was freezing, but I was having the time of my life, and my regulator froze open. So I signaled to everybody else, hey, you guys have fun, go on. My regulator froze open. I showed them, no matter what I do, I can't get this to stop. I'm out of here. And I took off. I headed for the surface. They were like, you know what, we're cold too. <laughs> and they left too. But things do go wrong. So stress and rescue is an awesome class for you to experience the uncontrolled and uncontrolled environment and help you recognize your own weaknesses so that you can grow as a diver. Um, dive guide is a, a great one to have. You can have that both commercial and private. Uh, private, it's great for you to just be able to take your friends and family out and go lead a dive, show them all the sites and stuff. It gives you a little bit more experience. Uh, dive guide is the very first uh, commercial position as well. And that puts you on the path to dive master, assistant instructor, instructor, until who knows, maybe you might get to Ben's level someday where you're this crazy goon who just does nothing but live, breathe, and eat diving. So uh, if that's something you want to look into, absolutely talk to Ben about that. I cannot get you that far, but he absolutely can. He's got me there, him there. Um, he's working on that now. Have you hit dive guide yet, or you're almost there? No, nope, he's got a way. He's got, got a way some, still. He's got some specialties to go. Okay. I've seen you around a lot. I didn't know where you were in the, the program. So, uh, You know about the Master Diver Challenge? Oh, yes. Uh, Master Diver Challenge, we do have a couple people on the board already. Once you hit Master Diver, you get entered into a, I believe it's a one week. Seven days. Mm -hmm. It's a seven day live aboard on an ingressor, which is a, a live aboard boat. You go basically on a, a mini cruise scuba diving. And so they... They send you down, they put you on a boat, they have all your diving, and I believe all you have to pay for is airfare for that seven days. You don't even have to pay that. Nope. Basically, so, what you'll do is you'll get up in the morning, you have breakfast, and you go diving, and you'll come back, you'll talk about diving, and then you'll go diving, and then you'll come back and have some snacks, and you'll talk about diving, and then you'll have some lunch, and you'll go out and you'll dive, and then you'll come back and talk about diving, and you'll relax for a while, and then get a tan, and you'll go diving, and then you'll have some more food, and then you'll go diving, and there's a, there's a theme here, by the way. <laughs> Unfortunately, that is bigger than just the shop, so you're not competing with just the four people that are out there. You're competing with everybody SSI worldwide. I competed against the guys here at the shop. None of us won. But it's a whole new year. You have a whole new chance, and all you need to do is hit 50 dives and four specialties. So if you do stress and rescue, please invite me. I love that class. That's a good master's to get out. Yep. So if you take five years to get there, sorry, you're out. All right, so tonight we're going to work on our pool skills. We're going to do equipment assembly, snorkeling. Once we're snorkeling, we're going to do snorkel clearing, blow out your tube. It's going to be really easy for you guys with the dry tubes. If you have a J tube, I'm sorry. I don't know what you guys have. Probably you at least have a semi dry. Uh, mass clearing, we're going to do mass clearing one, two, and three. Mass clearing one, we're going to flood our masks halfway up, fill it halfway with water, blow the water back out. That's going to be mask one. And I'll uh, it'll actually probably be Ben who indicates for you to do that. Uh, mask clearing two, mask two, all the way. You're going to flood your mask all the way. You're going to blow air into it. You're going to blow all the water out, and you'll be just fine. You're looking at me a little wide-eyed. I promise it's way easier than it sounds. The scariest part is, for me and him, it is a little nerve-wracking. You're always like, I'm going to lose my contacts. I haven't lost a contact yet. Hopefully you don't lose a contact either. Hopefully none of us lose a contact. But take your time. If you do it in one breath, awesome. You've got way more lung capacity than me. If you do it in two or three breaths, not a problem. If you do it in 10 to 12 breaths, we'll talk about it. We'll work you through it, but you've still done the skill. That's all you have to do to pass. Okay. Mask number three. Mask three. We're going to remove the mask entirely. We're going to take the strap, pull it around, wrap it over 
I don't actually have my mask in here. It's out in the car still. But you're going to bring the, the strap up over your, your hand. If you have that strap over your hand, it's going to make your life a lot easier because once you pull that mask off, most of us aren't going to open our eyes and be able to see. There are some people who can do that. I'm not one of them. But you're going to take that mask off. You're going to put it back on your face, pull that strap back over your, your head, and blow the air, air back into your mask, blow the water out, and you'll be on your way. Okay? So mask, mask, one, halfway. Mask, two, all the way. Mask, three, remove. Okay? And we will take all the time you need to get through those skills. I promise we're not going to rush you. Take your time. Just breathe through it. The only difference is you won't be able to, to use your nose quite as much. Just remember that. You cannot breathe through your nose underwater, ever, unless you do full face mask. That's an expensive sport, but it is really fun. I like it quite a lot. Uh, next, we're going to work on types of kick. You've got your, your basic flutter kick. You've got your dolphin kick. Uh, and you've got your frog kick. Just stay there. Oh, okay. Frog kick, dolphin. Or yeah. not frog, or, 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 flutter, flutter dolphin, sorry. Flutter dolphin, that's it. Yep. Okay. We're just, this is just snorkeling. So tonight we won't teach you frog. Uh, we're going to teach you equalization techniques, those six that we talked about. Hopefully you'll be able to get it with Valsava. That's the easiest. If not, we will work with you to clear your ears. Uh, head for snorkel diving. We're going to teach you three types of dive. We're going to teach you a kelp dive, a dolphin dive, and a head first dive. And the head first dive. Uh, coming up from the surface, a deep water exit, and a giant stride entry. Giant stride entry is just take a big step off. You'll keep that back leg locked and just let yourself fall into the water. Um, we'll walk you through that. That's probably going to be the first entry we do today. Uh, facing the water, breathing with your regulator. You will officially be on scuba air at that point. A basic weight check. We're going to make sure you can go down, you can come up, you know how to use your BC, and you're heavy enough to sink. Some people are floaty. We don't have anybody who's particularly floaty here tonight. But there are some people who, who tend to, to hold their breath. And that's actually going to make you way more buoyant holding your breath than being rounder. Uh, and then we're going to do some playtime with a buoyancy control line tonight. Is that here? Or is that over at the pool still? It's still at the pool. Okay, so we're not going to do the buoyancy control line tonight. Um, next slide. And we're here. And we're diving here tonight, not there. One more. One more. Where we're at. And that is the end of the slides for tonight. So, if you have gear out in the car, go ahead and grab that real quick. We'll go ahead and get everybody set up with some gear and we'll start teaching you how to assemble.